Hello, and welcome to our session for the Single Mom Faith Summit, turning your pain, setbacks, and trials into purpose. And so today we are here with Danielle Wright, Danny, as I affectionately call her, and most people do. But <laughs> so she, her session is going to be talking about healing your way into purpose. And so this is a topic that I think is very important. I'm going to warn you guys right now that it's, it's sensitive. It's very sensitive. So I just want you to be able to listen at your own pace. Um, if you need to hit, um, like take a break and come back and listen to the replay, that is totally fine because I understand right now that this topic may be sensitive and triggering for some. And I just wanted to give that as a full disclosure at the beginning of this session because we're gonna be talking about recovering from domestic violence. And I think that this is so important. I remember when the Lord started to download to me the things that we're going to talk about in the Faith Summit, and he put Danny on my heart. And the reason why is I actually have the you know privilege of being able to see her healing journey. And I think that her story is a testament to so many women and will bless so many women who have gone through domestic violence. And there are a number of women who become single moms because they went through a domestic violence situation. And at that point, you know, they're in a marriage or they're in a relationship and they're expecting things to go one way. Totally ends up being something different. And then they have to pivot into a whole new life. And so not only is the healing part, the physical and emotional healing part, challenging, but the starting over and having new life is also challenging as well. So I really wanted to invite Danny in here uh, for the summit to be able to help talk to us about finding purpose after pain, but also sharing some of the healing, the keys in terms of healing as well. So welcome, Danny. Welcome. Thank you. To the Face Summit. Thank you. You're Thank welcome. You. You're welcome. You're welcome. And so I just want to start off by asking, you know, what is it that you do? And can you just please introduce yourself to the ladies? Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be part of the um, Faith Summit and um, just being able to share with other women and even men that may be uh, listening in to the replay or live to the session. But Make it on in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, man. If you want to listen, by all means. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, because I think that a lot of sessions, um, even though they are meant for, for women, I believe that as men who may be in support of women who are listening in, um, we still need advocates. And I think even for my session, it's really important for men to listen in as well. So I hope there are some men that are listening. Um, as Aisha said, my name is Danielle. I go by Danny, and I am the founder and owner of Right Relations LLC. We are a boutique communications and branding firm based in the Cleveland, Ohio area. And we help entrepreneurs, speakers, authors, nonprofit organizations, and just even individuals who want to enhance their presence online, but also don't have a big, huge budget to do so. So we come in and we take over your social media and we help you brand your business or yourself in a way that effectively communicates with your target audiences and helps you tell your story in an effective, engaging, and interactive way. So um, that's in a nutshell, what I do, I um, call myself, not to like brag or boast, but the queen of creativity, um, <laughs> always having ideas. You're not boasting. <laughs> um, because I love always having ideas for people to enhance what they have, but then to also bring out what's inside of them and move that from oh, this is a thought or this is an idea or this is my vision to actually putting it into work and executing on the things that you think so that you are actually doing the work. 
I love it. I love it. I think that this is so important because people kind of get stuck, right? It's yeah. easy to come up with a lot of ideas, but it takes a whole new level, of another skill set to be able to implement them and put them into action. And so one of the questions that I wanted to ask you is, okay, so what we talked about before, what I introduced the session with is that many women become single moms after domestic violence, but emotional and financial connections can keep people there. And so I know you're not the sing- a single mom, so I know that, that but your story transcends marital status it truly does and so how did you get the courage to leave because sometimes people just don't leave there's a lot of reasons why people don't leave but what gave you the courage to leave because there might be a woman right now who is looking at this who is in this situation she wants to leave but she doesn't know how I think this is this is such a hard question because Courage is not always about doing things right away. Courage is not always about um, showing strength in a situation. A lot of times courage is realizing that you can't do it alone. A lot of times courage is realizing that the answer is not going to come right now. And so for me, there were several things that I realized, you know, and I look back and I'm like, I'm, I'm so blessed, you know, because I had a very strong support system that was able to get me out of the throes of the situation pretty immediately. Um, And so I was, immediately physically safe um, and had somewhere else to live. Um, But I realized that the courage to leave is, it goes far beyond not being around that person physically. And there were a lot of times where I did not cut things off right away. There was still communication. Um, But what that allowed me to see was for myself that this was not a situation that I needed to be involved in. And so I think sometimes the courage to do something comes from you drowning out the noise of other people's opinions and what other people have to say and really being able to focus in on finding the answers for yourself and um, also doing so in a healthy way, right? Um, Because we can find answers to everything, right? But it's not always healthy. And so what I had to do was throw myself into therapy um, pretty quickly um, because the first two, three weeks after it happened, I was very, um, I can't even describe what I was feeling and going through. Um, Emotionally, it's so much more than a roller coaster. Like at least on a roller coaster, you're like strapped in you know, you're secure that way. And you know, it's going to be over. You know about how long it is because while you're waiting in line, you're watching everyone else go on the roller coaster. Exactly. You can anticipate. Yeah, this is like um, hang gliding with a parachute with a hole in it. And it's like, it starts off as a small hole, but as the wind catches it, the hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger and you start to descend faster (laughs) and you're worried about not landing safely for lack of better terms. That's kind of what it's like, you know, it's like being up in the air with nothing to hold on to. So it's far beyond a roller coaster. It's far beyond like this idea that you're suddenly gonna be secure because you're not like 
you really have to throw yourself into your safety net. And that safety net needs to be very healthy. It needs to be very secure. It needs to be supportive. It needs to be able to carry the weight of the weight that's on you, right? And so you have to be very careful about who you're talking to. You have to be very careful about what you share with people. You have to be very careful about um, who you're sharing things with. Because what I learned is that not everyone was interested in helping me. There were some people that were just using what I said in the moment to go back and tell him what I was saying or what was going on. And so that created an even greater rift between he and I, where it was like, on top of what we were dealing with, there was a lot of he say, she say. Where I think that we both wanted to be able to communicate effectively with one another and not have all of the other stuff that was going on. But in that communication, I realized again that I had to separate myself from this person. Not because I didn't care, not because I didn't love them, not because I thought, and, and, and remember even thinking like, I really don't have a lot of like hard negative feelings toward him as a person. I don't hate him. I hate what he has done. I hate the results that have occurred from that but I don't hate him as a person. But we have to get to the point where courage to leave is not about pretending like nothing happened. It's understanding what happened and understanding you deserve better. And understanding that this person needs help, right? And by this person, I don't just mean the person, the abuser. I mean this person as yourself. Because you don't go through domestic violence, you don't go through being the victim of a crime or anything else like that, and then just move on with your life. So the courage to leave is about understanding that you need to heal. The courage to leave for me was about understanding that this thing happened. There's so much more that happened after that one incident. And that one incident caused a trickle down effect of other negative things in my life and in his life. And how do we, how do we get not over it, but through it. You gotta go through it. You have to, there's a healing process. And sometimes as you journey through to get to your healing, there are other things that compound the situation. And I think for me, it was the compounding of other things that really led me to saying, I cannot do this, right? I don't have, and it's not, I, I used to say, I don't have the strength to do this, but I realized that it wasn't about strength. It was about wisdom. I have too much wisdom to continue subjecting myself to a relationship that is unhealthy. Um, I love God too much to continue to put up with aspects of a relationship that are unhealthy because it go it literally goes against my religion. You know what I'm saying? Like it goes against what I say I believe. 
it goes against what I want other men and women to be able to do, and that's to heal. And I can't heal if I keep going back to the source that's ripping the bandages off every time there's an interaction. And it's not to say that it's always gonna be that way, but I think the courage to leave is not a split decision. And you have to make that decision every single day that you wake up. You have to make the decision to be courageous enough to leave a situation that is unhealthy. It's a daily situation, especially when you and this person were in love, you had a relationship, you were building a life together, right? So the courage and the decision to leave is not just a one and done thing. It is literally something that I have to decide every single day to leave behind a situation that is unhealthy for me. So how important is grace in there? Because when I think about it, when you said it's not one and done, right? Mm -hmm. And I think about um, how I misunderstood what forgiveness was. Once I learned that I had to forgive, that that was necessary because I resisted that for a while. But (laughs) once I learned that the Bible literally commands me to forgive and everyone to forgive, I thought that it was as simple as saying, I forgive you. Yeah, no. Have a nice life. And it's not like that at all. And Mm -hmm. so when you talk about it, and it's just like you're every day, you're choosing to, you know, leave that situation behind because you've already left physically. So you're emotionally having to leave it behind. So how important is it to give yourself grace in that it was not a one and done decision? Like you literally have to keep going because sometimes when we think something should be over and it's not, and we think we have to keep what we feel like we realize we have to keep going back to that same thing. At first, I was like, well, why? Why haven't I forgiven yet? Like, I, I, I thought I did. But sometimes it can be hard. And, you know, what I'm trying to say is, like, how important was it for you to continue to give grace to yourself because you weren't healed yet after the first time? I, I, <laughs> oh my gosh. I think that grace is one of those, uh, there, there's, it's two sides of one coin. There is, or maybe it's not even, maybe it's not even two sides of one coin. It's, it's triangular, right? Like, so there's self-grace, grace to others, but the foundation of it, the bottom, that support, that supporting side of that triangle is God's grace, right? And so we're able to build on both sides of the triangle, right? Because the foundation is there. The foundation is God's grace. So But so many times we only focus on the one side, right? God, give me grace. God, help me be gracious towards others, right? But that's just like, oh, you know, we're just flapping in the wind here, right? Because we're missing this other side. That the other side of the foundation of God's grace is not just grace to others. It's also grace to ourselves. And I think we all miss that. We're all hard on ourselves. I have conversations with you almost daily, with my therapist, with other close friends that one of the hardest things to do is give yourself grace in domestic violence. Why? Because hindsight is 2020. And you begin to look back at all the things you feel you missed. All of these red flags, but at the time, they may not have been red flags. There were some, right? But there were red flags for me 
personally toward the end of the relationship before his father passed away, I started noticing some, some changes, right? Um, but nothing to the point where it was like, I feared for my life or I felt like, oh my gosh, like, you know, there, there was really none of that for me. But I realized also that life was so different when we met. Um, I was working at a school where I was working very long hours. When I met him, um, you know, I was in the throes of a, you know, some various situations at work. I was releasing my book, you know, the first book. I was, um, you know, in, in talks with a really close friend of mine about how I felt like that was going to be my last year at the school and that I was ready to be like to do full-time entrepreneurship, right? I was ready for that. I was making plans to, I was, I was creating my exit strategy <laughs> and I felt like it was time, you know, and I would say three months after we met, or th no, three months after we started dating, the world shut down because of COVID. And when the world shut down, it didn't just shut down like, oh, we can't go places. It shut down everything. Like we were not, we couldn't go see our parents. We like, he was the only visitor that I was allowed to have because I lived on campus. And so, it was, I mean, literally for a year, it was just me and him. I mean, literally, actually, uh, probably a year and a half. Like it was just two of us, you know? And so there were a lot of things that I look back at now. And I had to share this with my therapist the other day because it's just, again, we're talking, um, we're talking three years later, right? And I'm just now realizing that there were things that I accepted back then that were probably would have been red flags had life looked differently. And so the need for grace in that is astronomical because I can't beat myself up by saying I should have, could have, would have because sometimes other life situations impact your view and how you see things and what your needs are in that moment. You know, um, I've always felt like I needed someone that was very firm, very strong, very, you know, passionate and vocal. And that's what I had. And it was like, yes, you know, finally. But the flip side of that is, well, at what point does being vocal and passionate really become verbal, emotional, spiritual, financial abuse? At what point? And I think a lot of times there's such a fine line between it because it's not something that just comes out. Like no one goes into the relationship just beating on someone. No one goes into a relationship cursing someone out. No one goes into a relationship um, mooching off of someone or, or chastising someone for how they spend their money. So the red flags don't start off always as red flags. Sometimes it's like a stoplight. It's green and then it's yellow, like, wait a minute, and then it turns red. And there's no time differential. There's no time clock or a stopwatch that says you're going to go from green light to yellow light in six seconds. Or you, you know what I'm saying? Like, there is no roadmap for that. And I do think that sometimes it takes us being broken in order to recognize what we need to look out for in the future.
And I think that that's the hard part. When you said sometimes you have to be broken in order to know what to look out for in the future, because truth be told, it's like experience. You can learn a couple of different ways <laughs> through your own experiences or through the experiences of other people. But then there's certain experiences that we don't get the wisdom from unless we go through it. And that's a very hard thing. But that thing also is that thing that God um, in Romans 8, 28 uses for our good. And it can be very hard and very, very difficult to see in that moment, especially with trauma, especially with abuse, um, things that just should not have happened, right? And, but still it's like, we have to have the faith that God can take those things and turn them into a beautiful picture. And right. which doesn't, it's like, you know, because the Bible says he could make the crooked path straight. He can make the brokenness, he can take the broken pieces and make them whole. Like that is who he is. That is such a wonderful God that he is. And so I want to ask you, I want to turn pivot to purpose because there's no timeline on healing. There's no timeline on grief. And so how do people, this is kind of a two-part question. You know, we talk about turning our pain into purpose. The whole point of this summit is turning your pain, setbacks, and trials into purpose. But I do think, this is Aisha talking, I think that there is a point where you can do that too soon, where mm -hmm. you can get out there and try and turn something into purpose with partial healing. Because I know for me, I did that. So um, when, so I actually, I shadow me, I had to do my dance, you said exit strategy, because I ended up exiting corporate finance to be a full-time entrepreneur. Two months later, ended up with getting pregnant. When I was four months pregnant, he walked out and, you know, I continue to get, you know, different opportunities, continue to be featured in like major publications and everything. So I'm just chucking along. I'm just chucking along, got two babies growing in my stomach and I'm just chucking along, not really allowing myself to be able to feel the brokenness and grief that I felt. Yeah. And so it really comes, my kids are about a year old at this point. And finally, I just get to the point like, cool. And then and the funny thing is, is that at, at that year point, I said, you know what? I'm gonna switch my financial literacy blog to empower single moms about their finances. And then not too long later, uh, maybe a year after that, it was full on, ah, stop. Because it was kind of like I hit a brick wall because I kept going. I never allowed myself to feel, heal, and grieve. And I kind of papered it over the things that I was feeling yeah. to be able to just keep the strength to keep moving again, because I feared that if I stopped and allowed myself to heal, that I would break. I didn't want to feel it, so I kept going. And then I never, like I said, never really gave myself that space to heal. But yeah, I'm trying to take, every, you know, 828, all these work together. So I'm like, you know what? I'm going to turn this into, because the Lord was telling me also to switch my blog to instead of just single women with finances, single moms with finances, because he was revealing to me that even though I was a teacher and educator of personal finances, that when I became a single mom, the things that I was talking about were still true, but they look different when implementing them into a life with a single mom. So he said, do that, but I didn't do the company healing <laughs> that comes with it. And so eventually it got to a point where I literally shut down my entire business because I could no longer do it. I could no longer serve single moms and feel so broken and so hurt about what it was that I went through. And so ultimately I wanted to frame it like that because I truly believe that there's a place where we try and move on to purpose too soon without allowing ourselves to be healed. And it can impact how we show up and ultimately how we walk in our purpose. And then when we hit that brick wall, like I felt, I thought I had to get full disclosure as, oh yeah, so God must not have been calling me to single moms. He must have been telling me to do something over there. And that's what I did. I ran over there. That was just like, oh yeah, I know. And, but it turned out a few, it took some years and some healing right. and some therapy. And he was like, no, I really meant what I said when I called you to single moms, but sometimes we can get it twisted because we didn't heal, heal properly. And we think that we didn't hear God properly and that we still have purpose, right. but it comes with healing. So how do you avoid 
not jumping in too soon or doing that partial healing or knowing even when now is the right time to still walk in purpose. And I know this is going to sound very cliche or overly simplistic, but God is going to tell you when it's time. Period. Like we can't believe that God is going to show up in every aspect of our lives from careers to, to a job, to um, what we do in ministry, to all this stuff. God, you mean to tell me that God is going to show up for you everywhere else, except for your healing. Mm -mm. It's not possible. That's not God's character. That's not how God operates. And so for me, it was like, I have to believe that God is going to heal me at the at the rate and at the time and in the right space and in the right way. I cannot heal myself. Right. I've tried that before. And what it led to was even more destruction, even more disappointments, even more dismay. Because I tried to pick up the pen that God was using to write with. And I was trying to write my own story. And God was like, wait a minute. Now, I'm the author and perfecter of your faith. Not you. <laughs> That's my job. And so I think that when we understand that God is the author. And we are the paper that he's writing on we can better understand that it is not our job to heal ourselves. It's our job to be obedient and faithful and committed to the process of our healing journey. And in that process, God will reveal to you what your next steps are, right? Because for some people, my desire in me talking about starting a nonprofit that supports women victims of domestic violence to have financial stability. Some people say, oh, you, you, that, that was too soon. You shouldn't have said that to, you shouldn't have. Why are you starting this? How are you, a vic, how are you, how are you an advocate of domestic violence already? My experience makes me an advocate. Just like I don't need to prove anything else to anybody to support, to support Black lives, right? I don't need to do, I was born a Black woman. That right there is enough for me to be an advocate <laughs> for equity and equality and no discrimination and all of that for Black people, right? So sometimes it's the situation that lends itself to us immediately knowing what God is calling us to do, right? I wouldn't have had as much of a burden for this had it not happened to me. But since it has happened to me, now God has placed on me the desire, the burden, the, a good burden to be a voice for those who feel they have no voice and to support the efforts of marginalized women to not be further oppressed because of a lack of access to care when they're in a domestic violence situation. I don't need to have a long history. You don't have to verbally emotionally, spiritually, financially abuse me for years. You don't have to beat me up multiple times for me to advocate for this, for me to have that burden on me to do something, right? It's not up to anyone. It wasn't even up to me. I didn't call myself to this. I did not call myself to this. This is not something that I would have wanted to be called to. So I need people to understand that, that like 
you may go through things and your calling and your purpose may be connected and a lot of times is connected to a very painful situation in your life. Not because you wanted to experience that pain, but God knew that you could handle it. And God knew that you were not going to then operate in your own power to overcome it and heal and help others that you knew and you understood that the only way, the only avenue to go from the valley to the mountaintop is to use the rope that God had let down for you to climb up. It's a God thing. It's not a Danny thing. It's not an Aisha thing. It's not a, it's not, it, it's not about anyone else saying that I should do this. It came to me in a split second literally in a split second i decided to go to therapy i had one therapy session and after that it was like i've got to do this god is calling me to start this organization and within 12 hours of me hearing that i had an entire board of directors like my entire board had commitments. And I couldn't have done that if it weren't for God calling me to that. And there's so many times where our ministry is birthed out of a painful situation. Look at Jesus. Mm -hmm. This man's entire ministry was based off of him sharing the good news of the gospel and leading people to salvation. Why? Because he knew he was going to die. He knew he was called to be <laughs> the sacrificial lamb. He knew that. Can you imagine the amount of pain that existed in Jesus? knowing that he was the, like, he was going to be called to be the, what, God, what? I gotta be the, for them? For them, they great. Do you see them over there in their hot mess? Yep. Come on. Like, so when we think about our purpose and when we think about the things that God has called us to do, he's not going to, I don't believe he will call you to do something without giving you a testimony on why you're doing it. And it doesn't always mean that we have to be the ones that go through it, but we may be the ones that we realize, like if someone else goes through this situation, but we realize that we're the ones like, we can help people find the resources that they need to heal. So maybe your purpose and your ministry and your calling and what you're supposed to do is birthed out of your ability, your, the, a gift in the spirit that God has given you, but you're still connected to a certain group of people. You're still connected to someone else's point of pain. And so, but for me, my ministry and the work that I've done has always been birthed out of pain. Always. And so I think that there's still, even if we are helping other people and it's not something that we experience firsthand, we still are grieving with them or there's a point of grief, a point of sorrow, a point of pain for us to then turn it into something that God has called us to do and that's really hard it's really hard to accept that we have to sometimes be in pain to push through to live our purpose you know a friend of mine um I was having a conversation with him and he said because we were talking and this was really during the time I was battling where I was just like really I'm just, I was still running from the single mom ministry, right? And when he told me, he was like, this is what you have to understand. 
So you have to understand that purpose is the, at the intersection. What do you say? He said purpose is at the intersection of pain. Mm-hmm. It's like, it's where, you know, it, it collides. Like it's no way that you can have purpose without the pain. And I think that that is a hard message. And even when you talked about everything that you've done, I was like, wait a second. What I was doing with financial literacy, right? It was birthed out of a painful moment because I was teased when I was 12 over some shoes <laughs> and it put me on this journey where I did not believe that, um, I thought that I just needed to fit in with everyone else. Yeah. And for me, fitting in with everyone else meant spending a lot of money to be able to fit in with everyone else. And my finances, and then I ended up starting a business because I said, your finances are not, um, what did I say? Your finances are not connected to your self-worth. Your self-worth is not connected to your finances because I always assumed that my self-worth was connected to my finances. Mm-hmm. And it's like, I had to go through the process of untangling those things, breaking those things and being and in the process. I learned how to manage my money differently. I yeah. learned how to manage it authentic, uh, authentically. And in that, that is what led me to start the business with teaching others how to manage their money not because a lot of these people don't know how to make a budget because a lot of people do and they don't practice it but finances so much of finances is emotional and my financial journey and financial struggles were rooted in the emotional piece of finances it wasn't the technical piece of finances I have an MBA in finances. I have an economics degree. I worked in corporate finance, managed a $1 billion budget. And one day I woke up and said, how do I know how to manage a $1 billion budget, but I can't manage my own finances? Emotion. And so the Lord took that place of pain and birthed the financial literacy business, which became an exit strategy for corporate. But then it's like, you know, you, this is a whole nother thing. I did not even think about talking about trucking along in purpose, right? Say yes to purpose. And then what? More pain? What? <laughs> I was like, wait a second. But then it's just yeah. like, okay. As I walk to the other side of it, it's like, okay, now I have a whole new layer of purpose, mm-hmm. right? Because there's so many people talking about money, but no one understands what it's like to manage money as a single mom. Yeah. It's, and so it's just, you know, sometimes he can use other points of pain because we think that, okay, we find it. Aha, uh-huh, I figured it out, right? But yep. then the pivots come. And like, even with you, like you do branding and marketing. Don't you think you can use those skills for your nonprofit? And so it's just like, he layers on so many different things to help direct us. Like, because he might have us going at one purpose. He's like, okay, this is the training ground. I'm gonna redirect you a little bit to go somewhere else. Okay, uh, please no more training grounds, please no more. But you know, it's just he just really <laughs> uses all of those. See, I almost lost my thought when I said that. But he uses all of those things to continue to move us into purpose because our purpose is never done until we die. Mm-hmm. And so he continues to use these things, continues to sharpen us, continues to refine us to allow us to become who we need to be to do what he has called us to do because sometimes we can get the revelation but we're not ready and there's still some refinement that has to happen just like me I thought that I was wrong in what I heard God say he said go help these single moms and I'm just like okay no you must have been tripping because why did I hit this brick wall like this makes no sense but it wasn't like that it was just I had to go through a deeper level of healing to be able to move into where he has called me to be and so it's just yeah and I think it's also important to understand that your purpose may change yeah your purpose can change purpose purpose is not always lifelong right you don't suddenly just your purpose doesn't just suddenly appear and then that's it for the rest of your life Mm -hmm. God has momentary momentary purposes for us as well. And I think that when we understand that, we're better able to function and operate in the way that he needs us to because we understand that 
this position may not be always, right? Mm -hmm. um, this may not be all that God has for me to do. My purpose may start off as um, financial literacy for single women. Mm -hmm. But after I've gone through some things, I may need to niche down and say, ooh, I really need to focus on single mothers. But then what if I go through something else and God is like, yeah, okay. Now, based off of your experience and based off of what you see and based off of how society is, now I want you to focus on single black mothers. Oh gosh. But that's not, mm -mm, God, that's too much. Like I'm going to miss up. I'm gonna, you know how much business I'm gonna miss if I just only talk to single black mothers? Like, God, like that's too much, or that's not enough. Like, I'm gonna miss money doing that. Like, and we begin to overthink what God is telling us that we need to do because we think we're missing blessings by excluding certain people from our purpose what God is saying these people are your purpose and do what I say right now so that down the line you'll be able to understand why I told you that this is only your group for right now right um so I've I've really I've really been able to, and this is not something that happened immediately. This has literally been with like in the last week, maybe two weeks. I'll give myself two weeks. <laughs> Max, maximum of two weeks. Like I'm really, really on the precipice of like, no, it's, it's, it's a week. <laughs> but understanding that, um, not only is my healing not linear, there are times that God is going to use us while we're healing to help heal others. Oh yeah. And then our healing and, comes through that. Yes. And we can't shy away. We can't be um, docile about it. We have to be bold. And I think that because I understand now how much God needs me to be a mouthpiece for women victims of domestic violence, especially those who are. And I wanna be very clear that the need I'm seeing is based off of my own experience because I was deemed safe. And because I was deemed safe, the resources are minimal for me. Because the, the abuser is no longer in the home, I'm deemed safe. I'm deemed like, well, there's not a risk. There's no urgency for you to move. There's no urgency financially. And what people don't see is that to leave a, a violent situation an abusive situation I don't care if it was just one time like in my case or if it's something that you dealt with for months for weeks for days for years whatever the case is your decision to leave in that moment that's your courage and it is also um represents your need for assistance right but what I noticed was that because he was no longer in the home, um, physically not allowed to come around, and I was in a different home, my needs were to, to the system numb. I had no needs. But it's like, what about cutting, separating ourselves from the things that we had that were together? And people don't realize, and I didn't even realize, right? It took me going through it to understand that there's so much financial stress in leaving that it actually causes a lot of women to stay. Yep. 
Yeah. They can't afford to leave their abuser. That's devastating. And there is absolutely no way God intends for that to be the case. And so many women end up going back, risking their lives, risking the lives of their children, risking other people's lives, right? Or even their abuser's life, because at some point you hit a breaking point. And that breaking point too many times ends with the death of the victim or the abuser. Why? Because financially the victim could not afford to separate herself from her abuser. And that's wild to me. And I only know that because I went through it myself. And I'm still, you know, I'm still going through it. I'm still dealing with the financial burden of leaving without access to the resources that are available to women who are not safe. And by no means do we take away from the women who are not safe, right? But we also have to be, that we have to stand in the gap for the women who leave and are still in need. And we shouldn't have to rely on GoFundMes and Facebook fundraisers and all of that. Mm -mm. I want women to be able to come to um, the, the, the Well Women's Ministry, right? And, 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 and be a resident of the Oasis house because they had the courage to leave. And I want them to be supported. I want them to have provision for the vision they have for their lives, a better life, a life of healing, a life without abuse, a life filled with safety, and a life that's filled with financial stability. So Aisha, when you talk about helping single mothers live in their purpose and live a life of financial freedom, you cannot be financially free when the system puts up roadblocks for you to gain access to the finances and the resources you need. And so that's my burden right now, to stand in the gap and to be an answer to that point of pain. You had the courage to leave. You had the courage to separate yourself from a situation that was unhealthy for you. You have to be able to get back on your feet. And to do so, you need resources. So someone has to be that answer. Someone has to be that guide to say, you know what, come, come here. <laughs> we're going to provide for you, but we're also going to teach you what you need so that you never have to deal with an abuser ever again. And you break the patterns that lead to choosing. Mm hmm the same person because if you don't heal then you end up choosing the same person in a different skin in a different skin you do and I think that when we don't provide people with what they need they go back to what they're used to mm -hmm. and we can't always like one thing that I've, I've seen too much of, I've experienced it is the victim shaming. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you don't need anything or, well, why are you still talking to him? Or why are you this? Or why this? And why that? And, you know, if you were really upset, then you would be this. And, oh, you don't look like you've been abused. Well, I'm glad that I'm not walking around with broken bones and it's like uh, praise Jesus for healing. <laughs> yeah. Because sometimes the abuse is not always physically evident. Like I couldn't show anybody all of my bruises. Some of my some of my bruising was in places that I couldn't even see. 
but it doesn't mean that there are no injuries. It doesn't mean that there's no pain. It doesn't mean that the situation didn't happen. And it doesn't mean that the situation wasn't as severe just because you can't see with your physical eye what I went through. Right. And I think this is like the whole, as, as I listen to you share, this is like the whole basis beyond, like behind this faith summit. Because as you were talking about what you went through, I know for me, when I became a single mom, I just, I couldn't believe it. I'm like, wait a second, but I'm educated. Like I have yeah. two undergrad, I have two undergraduate degrees, a minor and two master's degrees. I just quit my six figure job to be to walk in purpose because that's what I heard the Lord say. And did I mention that I was just featured in Essence? But yet now this is my story, right? Mm-hmm. And I could not make sense of it. And all I could do is just think about what went wrong? How could this happen to me? And then what society says about single moms, it's just like, and low key, even in the church, right? It's just like, people want to shame the person who raised their hand and said, I'm going to be a parent, right? But then wants to give the person, um, you know, uh, the other person a pass for leaving. And so it's like, I had to deal with like, you know, with what society was saying, a single mom would be what kids, like what kids were saying, who, um, single moms of kids, children of single moms would be. And then like, I went into this overdrive. I'm like, that's not going to be my reality. Like, I am not going to be that stereotypical welfare single mom. And why do we stereotype these people anyway? Because the things that we're speaking about them, why don't like people become what they're told that they're going to be? And so it's just like, God gave me this fight to be different and to change the narrative about what it means to be a single mom and to say, you know what? You can walk in purpose. It's possible to walk in purpose. You can be financially free as a single mom. You can raise thriving kids as a single mom. Did I expect this to be my portion? Absolutely not. But am I going to, now that I'm on, now that I have healed, am I ready to say, you know what, Lord, use me because if it takes me going through what I went through to show other moms that there is hope on the other side, that they don't have to give up all their hopes and dreams or sacrifice themselves on the altar of motherhood or single motherhood or whatever, but to show that there's something different is possible because all we see in the news and in the media and in TV shows is the broken down single black mom, right? And that's who she is. And for, you know, and for white single moms, what do they portray her as? The trailer park woman, right? And Mm -hmm. it's so negative. No matter what ethnicity you are, it's so negative. And so when you constantly see the negative, there's no hope. How are you going to have hope? How are you going to know that there's more? And so it's just, he's put this burden on me. And it's interesting how it takes a second. It's like, okay, I'm gonna teach you how to manage, help these single moms manage your money. So now I'm gonna help them to be who I created them to be. Exactly. And but, and it's like, you get this burden because of what you went through. And I know uh, we were talking before the session started, before the interview started. And I told you, I was gonna ask you the question, do you have to go through what you went through to have purpose? to have your purpose or can it be birthed through other places? Because I'm thinking about, I was just thinking about Tony Robbins because Tony Robbins, you know, he was hungry as a cat, as a child. I think his mom was a single mom and he was hungry. He frequently was hungry as a child. And so he doesn't work directly in fighting childhood hunger, but what he does is he takes his, his Tony Robbins trainings and he takes profit from, you know, from what he does from his Mm -hmm. business and he donates money to fight childhood hunger and to fight hunger. And so I wanted to ask you like, what are your thoughts on that? Because some people might be like, okay, look, I went through X, Y, and Z. I really don't want to have to beat a mantle and the standard to work in this area, but do is purpose always connected to pain? So I guess it's a question. I feel like it is. And I think that we discussed this a little bit before. I feel like it's always connected to pain and it may not be your personal experience, right? But it's an experience that you can um, empathize and sympathize with, which means that it's someone else's pain. 
but it's so closely connected to your heartstrings that you have no choice but to make it part of your purpose, right? God is calling you to that because there's something inside of you that he needs for you to be the answer and that touch point so that someone else is getting what they need. So no matter, no matter how you look at it, purpose is always connected to someone's pain. The world had fallen, the fall of man had occurred. Jesus was the answer to sin. Pain. 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 It's always connected to pain. This is, I just thank you so much for spending your time. And I totally forgot to mention this because I was having such a great time listening and soaking up what you were saying and just having a conversation. I forgot to tell the listeners that if they want to hit replay on this, be able to fast forward, rewind, get to your favorite part, sit down, meditate on some of the stuff that we were talking about, you can get the all access replay. So make sure you check out the link below the video to get your all access replay. Do not leave this whole summit without that all access replay. So I definitely wanted to make sure I mentioned that because I was like, oh my gosh, Danny is sharing so many nuggets. And I know people are going to need to listen to this again, especially if you are someone who is struggling with what is my purpose? Do I even have purpose? Um, or maybe you've been, because I've heard people say this too, that they've been through too much pain mm -hmm. and they're wondering if they even have purpose. And so I truly believe that this video, not this video, this interview, it, my brain is like so sleepy right now. Um, this training is going to set you free. It is truly going to set you free and to allow yourself to hear from God that he never left you nor forsake you. He has a purpose and plan for you. It doesn't matter what it looks like on the outside. He is still there. He is Amen. in the midst of everything. And he has a purpose and plan for you. And so it's just about trust. It's about rebuilding. It's about getting back up again. It's about developing the faith to believe that it's possible and that God has not forgotten about you. Amen. And so, yes. And so I just want to ask you, is there anything else that you want to leave with the ladies before we close? Wow. I would just say um, that it's important for you to not walk this journey alone. Um, no matter how um, bad your situation is, you have to find a place of respite. You have to find a place um, and a space and surround yourself with people that are going to bring peace into your life. And if you are speaking with people or interacting with people who are actually causing you to feel more confused and conflicted, then as hard as it is, you have to understand that those people are no longer part of your purpose. They're no longer to be connected with you because God is a God of order, which means that he removes chaos from our lives and brings calm. So, and that's the other thing, like I suggest you all get on my idea to income and go back and listen to the chaos to calm Bible study series that Aisha did over the last 25 days. Um, well, actually it's, not the last 25 days. When this, when this summit airs, it, 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 during the month of February, Aisha did 25 days of Bible study called chaos to calm. And I really think that that is something that you all should listen to, journal, get the workbook from my, my idea to income and really go through the Bible study because it does allow you to tap into your truest emotions and feelings, and also understand that God has wired us. He designed us to be emotional beings, but he also designed us to take our emotions to him so that we can operate in a state of 
calmness and not calamity, not chaos, not confusion, not being in constant conflict with others. But I will tell you that that's where grace comes in for yourself because you are going to be conflicted. You are going to be confused. You are going to have moments where your emotions are in utter chaos. Why? Because you went through a situation that no one ever deserves to go through, ever. And so the hurt and the pain and the emotions that come from being in a domestic violence situation are far beyond anything that I could ever put to words. But I want you all to know that I hear you. Even in your silence, I hear you. And there is help for your hurt. There is healing and wholeness for your hurt. And no one can tell you how long it's going to take you to go from hurt to healed, but it's there. And it's a process and it's a journey that you have to walk on. It's not linear. There are going to be hills and valleys. You're going to come to forks in the road. And sometimes you will get, you will go left when you should have gone right. And you'll get halfway up the road or to the end of the road and realize now you got to come back down the road. You just went that up and then take the other road. And you know what? That's okay. Because there's no roadmap for this. And sometimes as humans and emotional beings, we make decisions out of our emotions and not out of the plans that God has for us, but his plans for us still exist. So let me tell you something, sister, who is in a domestic violence situation and feeling like they wanna go back. It is okay to feel that way. Don't beat yourself up over it. Understand that you are going to have those emotions and those feelings because you were intimately connected with another being. And it is not natural for us to just cut it off. It's like saying, oh, my index finger, I don't need it anymore. Let me just break it. Let me just chop it off. That's not natural. The domestic violence was not natural right? But also cutting off that relationship cold turkey is also not natural for us. So I want you to feel everything that you feel. But I want you to understand that there is a healthy way for you to respond to how you feel. And my hope is that even if you just reach out to me where I can be a conduit to get you from these these emotions to resources to help you handle your emotions, I want to be that. I want to be that conduit for Jesus. I want to be the hands and feet and heart and mouthpiece for Jesus, right? Because as his ambassador, I understand that there are certain situations that I've been through that only I can speak out on. And I want to do that. And I want you to know that it's okay. And you may not feel okay right now. You may not be okay right now. And that's okay as well. Because in the morning, in the morning, your morning will end. Trouble does not last forever. And there's an end. There is the light at the end of this long, dark tunnel and healing sometimes feels dark and healing sometimes brings about more pain than what we thought we were going to have to deal with but that is when something heals when you have a wound that's healing it itches and you want to scratch it and dig into it because as the healing process you're you're 
things are being pulled back together. And you may have a little scar there. You may have a little battle wound there. But that, that scar means that you went through something and God was still able to cover. And I want you all to know that you, while you're going through, keep going through and allow someone to reach out and, and take your hand and help you go through it. I think that was so powerful. Don't go through it alone because when we're isolated, that's really when the danger happens. That's when the enemy gets to have a field day and start to whisper and try and convince people that it's just go back and make it all feel better because that's what the abuser is saying. Just go back. Everything will be better. Yeah. But it's important for that person to know, that woman to know that she has resources, that she has someone to call, Absolutely. that she has someone to contact because some, like you said, some people might not have resources at all. And that's why I absolutely love what it is that you're doing in the mission and the ministry that you have mm -hmm. because you're giving these moms, these women hope. You're giving them hope. You're giving them, you're helping them to find new life again. You're helping them to live again. And I was just thinking about like, you know, about dry bones living again, right? Because sometimes when we go through traumatic experiences, it can feel like a land of dry bones. But this is why that guy uses people to be able to put them in positions, to be able to help his children live again, because he has a purpose and plan for anyone, everyone, and he's not his, he doesn't want anybody to suffer. Like he doesn't want people to die without walking in purpose. He does not want to lose the lost sheep. He leaves exactly. the 99 to go after the one. So that's a lot. Like. It just shows you how committed he is to people. Mm -hmm. He gives people to bless people. So if you're on the fence, if you think that you've been through too much, if you think that you've experienced too much trauma, too much setback, too much trials, just know that God has a plan even for that. He still has a plan for you. And there are people out there who are in the midst of a storm, in the midst of darkness, and the only person that they will be able to hear from is you. And it's not to say that to put pressure on you or anything, but just to tell the truth that your healing is connected to someone else's breakthrough. Your healing is connected to your own peace. Let's be clear. Let's be clear that your healing is connected Absolutely. to your future. But beyond you and beyond your children, someone else is waiting in the wings and that they need the hope that only you can bring. So yeah, so now you see why you need to get that all access pass because that, <laughs> you can't listen to this just one time. You can't listen to this one time because there's breakthrough in this message. There's breakthrough in it if you internalize it and understand it and Amen. take it to the feet of Jesus. So yes, yes, yes. So I just thank you. So how can the ladies get in contact with you? Um, you can connect with me on Instagram at right w r i g h t underscore relations with an s at the end. Um, you can also follow my Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash right relations. Um, you can email me at danielle at right relations.com. Um, what else? My website is right relations.com. Um, if you're interested in learning more about branding and how I can help you, go to dannyrwright.com. That's D-A-N-I-R-W-R-I-G-H-T.com. That's to join my email list and get some really cool tips and tools and freebies and things like that. Um, so yeah, like I'm all over social media. So, um, I know I have a pretty common name, but if you do a search for my business, you're more likely to find me than searching for my name. But, um, I just want to thank you so much for having me today. Um, thank you for this conference, this summit. I know it's going to be awesome and change so so many lives and I can't wait to hear the women and even the men that sneak in and listen or <laughs> I just can't wait to see how many lives are changed because of this work so thank you Aisha for 
your heart, um, but also for your sacrifice and most importantly, for your obedience. We talk about it so much, but um, obedience is so much um, more rewarding. It's so much greater than sacrifice. So thank you for your obedience to pour into the, a world of women who need a touch in a different way. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being here and sharing your story. I I really appreciate it, and I know the ladies who are blessed by your story are truly um, will appreciate it as well. And so, thank, thank you. you so much. And so, thank yes. you, ladies, for yes. joining. <laughs> I appreciate you. One more plug for the All Access Replay. Don't forget it. And again, I am your host, Aisha Taylor, and I help single moms live in purpose and in financial freedom. And so, yes, I will see you on the next one. Bye. Bye, everyone.